I don't even know what to say anymore. I really don't. I'm kind of perplexed all about this, uh, the whole podcast uh, scenario that's going on. Everybody want to start a podcast. Don't even know what to talk about. Podcast here, podcast. Just stop it, please. There's only one podcast that y'all should be listening to. And that's my main man, Josh Petrie, right here on the Sports Nerd Podcast. <laughs> And now your host, my daddy, Josh Petrie. <laughs> All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Sports Nerds Podcast, Episode 5. My guest today will be Kevin Jones, former West Virginia Mountaineer basketball player that helped lead the team 2010, the Final Four against Duke, uh, who's also, you know, he went undrafted in the NBA and he's trying his hand at some EuroLeague and international basketball right now. So we'll speak with him after a couple segments. Uh, it's been a while since we've since I've done this. Uh, you know, sometimes you, you get overwhelmed with things when you have a passion for it like I do. I've had the website for... July will be five years, and the podcast is rather new, but sometimes you just got to step back. I wanted to spend some time with the family, not travel, you know, not uh, not have a microphone in front, of, in front of my face and not write anything for a little while, but it's good to be back. 2018 is going to be pretty special for sports nerds, looking to cover some Major League Baseball for the first time. I think that's the, that's the only thing we haven't covered. Uh, so looking to get to maybe Pittsburgh and Cincinnati and cover the Reds and the Pirates this year. We'll see how that goes. On the 11th of this month, I'll be headed to Pittsburgh to cover the Louisville game and back to Pittsburgh again on the 24th to cover the Virginia game. I went up a couple of years to go to cover Pittsburgh, and uh, it's always a good time. You know, the fans are great up there. I love that city, and it's always a good time when I go there, so I enjoy that. I know some of the guys on Twitter that are hardcore WU faithful can't stand that I'm going to cover Pitt, but like I said, credentials are credentials. I'll, I'll travel pretty much anywhere to, to be able to cover an event. Um, also coming up this year, you know, working on a lot of things, working on some segues as far as the podcast itself goes, working on some more intros and things like that. You know, probably going to try to add some things every month, some funny little things, and even working on a, a co-host coming up before long. Uh, you know, I'd like to have somebody in a couple of weeks, but also wanting to bring in some childhood friends to help co-host from week to week when one of them can't maybe bring another one in. So, you know, we'll have that banter back and forth and things like that and every one of them are knowledgeable when it comes to sports so i like to get them involved and it's hard to keep the conversation going you know when i'm sitting here talking to myself so anybody that does it knows knows that's true so uh like i said just sit back and enjoy episode five we'll talk a little super bowl we'll talk uh, calves turmoil if you can call it turmoil i should probably use a stronger word for that but uh it's good to be back so let's dig right in Super Bowl 52 uh seeing the eagles beat the patriots 41 33 for the eagles first ever super bowl championship I guess you could say it was a good game. I mean, that's obviously heavy sarcasm. It was a great game. It was one of the best games I've ever seen. If you don't believe me, you can ask my wife. My wife has to be around sports all the time, but she won't sit and analyze things and watch the whole entire game every snap like I do. But this game, I don't think she missed a snap. She'll come and go and come in and out of the room and ask some questions and things like that, and she knows what's going on. But at the, at the end of this game, she was on the edge of her seat. I mean, she was really, really involved. That tells you how good this game was. But uh, one thing I don't understand is what's with the destructive, you know, destructive behavior when you win a championship? You would think it would be the total opposite. You would think you would be mellowed out, relaxed, and maybe pick up a broom or something and go out and pick up some garbage or not turn some cars over and not, you know, tear down light poles and break windows, break in businesses. I just, I cannot understand that at all. You know, maybe somebody could, you know, throw some light on that subject, but I have no idea. But you would think it would be the total opposite. Anyways, uh, you know, back to the game itself. The one thing that stood out to me, the referees let them play. They let them be physical the way you want the game to be played, especially in a game of that magnitude. There was no uh, BS PI calls or, or targeting calls and things like that. Like that. Let them be physical the whole game, and it was pretty much a flawless game, but that's what you want to see. And, you know, another question is what do you do with Foles? Okay, will they keep Foles? Will they start Wentz when he comes back? Or will they get rid of Foles so he can get paid elsewhere? Because deservingly so, he's if he goes elsewhere, he's going to get paid because of the run he was on. But Wentz is not supposed to be back to August 1st or mid-October, so what if they keep Foles and Foles brings that team to 4-0, 5-0 when it comes time for Wentz to come back? Then you got a whole other you know, problem on your hands. But 
if some Eagles fans or anything can, you know, comment. I've talked to a lot on Facebook, and they seem to think that Foles is going to be there, but I just want some opinions on that. So if you can get with me on Facebook or Twitter or comment on YouTube, things like that, I would like to hear from you on that subject. The Malcolm Butler mystery. What did Malcolm Butler do to not play a single snap in the Super Bowl after playing like, I don't know how many, you know, 96% of the snaps this season he has played? What did he do to get in Belichick's doghouse? I've heard conflicting reports that he he got caught smoking weed. I've heard that he was late to to whatever team meeting practice. I don't know what it was, but it has to be something horrendous for, for Malcolm Butler not to be on the field. Would it have changed the outcome of the game any? I think so. Maybe Malcolm Butler would have, you know, he would have had a key tackle or maybe he would have forced a, a timely turnover or something. Maybe the outcome would have been different if he was on the field. But I can guarantee you one thing, he won't be in New England next year. He will be elsewhere because – of what he put on Twitter, you know, that was pretty much his goodbye letter, so I think he is gone. Um, you know, will the, will the Pats break up? Uh, I've heard reports that the three main people in that franchise, Belichick, Kraft, and Brady, one of them won't be there in the next season or two, and I've heard a lot of things saying that maybe the Patriots don't make it back to the Super Bowl. Is this the end of the run? But, you know, regardless, Brady is the greatest of all time. I don't care what anybody says. That's just how it is. He's the greatest of all time. But if anybody goes, you know, I, I think it might be Belichick. Will he retire? Will he go elsewhere? I don't know. But do the Patriots have a couple more years left in? I, you know, I don't know. That's a discussion for another day. Uh, going back to, you know, talking about Foles and things like that, a backup QB. If you remember, Foles and Case Keenum were in L.A. together a couple years ago, and I thought both were absolute garbage in L.A., but, you know, what got into Case Keenum? You see a lot of guys come out of college like that where Case Keenum put up those numbers with Houston and you see him be a bust in the NFL. But, we'll, you know, Case Keenum, is he going to get paid in a couple years and things like that? So how's it going to work out for these quarterbacks that the young guys like Bortles and things like that who made a, a deep run in these playoffs? You know, is it is it just a, a fluke or will we see this from, you know, from in the future? Uh Green Bay, you know, that team's going to be back together. They're all going to be healthy again. Rodgers will be back. So uh, I think they'll be clicking once again. But I can, I personally, I don't think that New England will get back to the Super Bowl. I think that runs over with. If they do, I think it will just be for one more year, which will be next year, and then I think that runs over. But either way, it was one of the, the best Super Bowls I've ever seen. And if you don't believe me, you can ask my wife. But uh, we'll, we'll come back and talk a little Cavs basketball. Okay, the Cleveland Cavaliers, that team is in absolute turmoil right now. Ty Lewis lost control of the team. Something needs to be done. Me personally, I'll break this team up right now before it's too late. You know, some these bringing all these per, conflicting personalities and things in, I've had this discussion before, it doesn't always work. Some moves I make, I get rid of J.R. Smith, I get rid of Shumpert, and if you absolutely have to, I guess I would get rid of Tristan Thompson. But in return, I'm going to need something like a DeAndre Jordan. And I would say Kristaps Porzingis, but he's not on the move. And he just tore his ACL, so he's out. I would like to have Andre Drummond. But he's not going to be on the move because they, bought, they brought Blake Griffin in to be of a, you know, a twin towers of sorts there in Detroit. I don't know if Blake Griffin's a rental or not. If he is, bring him to Cleveland next year. We need a dominant center. We need someone who's going to play some D because – I think every single person on that team right now has forgot how to play defense. They've given up on one another. There's bickering back and forth. There's finger pointing. But I blame two people. I blame Ty Lue, LeBron James. Some people might find that odd because they know my my love for LeBron James. I always have liked this guy since he came in the league. But if he, you know, anybody cannot deny if you're a LeBron fan knows that he is a prima donna. You know, he he's pointing fingers. He's wanting to do this and that. But he's also earned the right to call some people out. But there's a time and a place to call people out. And apparently these things are getting leaked. There's somebody in the Cavs locker room that is telling the media what goes on behind closed doors. So, you know, what do you do? I think we need to be sellers at the trade deadline, which comes up at 3 o'clock on Thursday. But some moves that I had heard, they want to bring in George Hill. Why? George Hill plays 0-D. What's he going to do for you? I think he's averaging like 10 points this year. Another name I've heard, Tyreek Evans. He, you know, he's having one of the best seasons that he's ever had, but he also plays zero D. The only one that makes sense is bringing in DeAndre Jordan right now. 
because, you know, when's the last time Cleveland had a dominant center? You could say Zidrunas Ogaskas, but he wasn't considered a dominant center. He was seven foot three, and, you know, he filled the lane, but – some you know something needs to be done. I've heard Kimba Walker's name mentioned. We, we you know we don't need another guard. Do we keep Isaiah Thomas? Do we keep Kevin Love? I can tell you one thing as a Cavs fan, you know wholeheartedly, if Kevin Love keeps getting treated like a redheaded stepchild, let's go ahead and ship him out, and you know let him go to a place back home or somewhere in Portland or somewhere where he's going to be happy and have the freedom that he needs to do whatever he wants to do. You know, he was brought to Cleveland to stay out on the perimeter. That's not who Kevin Love is. Kevin Love likes to get down low and bang a little bit, but at the same time, he gets bullied. But we we need a dominant center on this team. This team is playing zero D right now. The effort is not there. You know, LeBron and these guys need to look in the mirror. Me, personally, I make a coaching change. I get rid of Ty Lue, and I bring in someone who is firm but yet a player's coach. A guy like Mark Jackson, who I think could, could you know, could get this team back under control. But like I said, this team needs to be sellers at the deadline. Uh, Isaiah, you know, we, there was this beef going on between Isaiah Thomas and Kevin Love. These guys grew up together. They're, you know, they're the closest ones on this team. They grew up together. They played AAU ball together. They they stayed at each other's house. So, you know, whatever goes on with them goes on with. With friends, that's not something that needs to leak to the media. But of course, they both denied denied that, obviously. But something needs to be done with this team. A pitiful effort against the Magic last night, scoring nine points in the fourth quarter. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous right now. But you know, Kevin Jones and I we, we talked a while back, and he said that there's really no reason to panic right now. But me, on the other hand, I think there is absolutely it is absolutely time to panic right now because I think. If some things aren't done here about the trade deadline, I think it's going to be too late. And I can tell you one thing. LeBron James isn't leaving Cleveland. LeBron James is going to do what he needs to do to bring, you know, some people into Cleveland so he can win another championship. But this year, I don't think there's anything Cleveland can do to beat a Houston or a a Golden State. I just don't think it's in the cards this year or maybe even next year. You know, maybe it doesn't matter what you do, but I, I can't see that happening. But, Something absolutely needs to change. We need some guys who can play some D. We need some heart and effort back on this team, and I'm just not seeing it right now. But we'll uh, we'll get to Kevin Jones here shortly. All right, my guest this week on this week's podcast, a former WU great who led WU to an appearance in the Final Four in 2010 against Duke and would later sign with the Cleveland Cavaliers and is now working his way up the ranks internationally. Kevin Jones, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. How are you? Good, good. I appreciate you calling in today. Yeah, no problem. Uh, you know, I want to start. I want to start with the the present, and we'll work our way back to the past. Uh, one question I have is, how does preparation differ from the Euro League international, you know, game to the NBA as far as rule changes, things like that? Um, as far as as far as preparation goes, I think um, between Euro League and um, the NBA, well, NBA, you know, you have um, you have a ton of games. You got eighty two games in NBA, so it's kind of hard to be, you know, always always kind of focused and locked in and always fresh because, you know, with so many games and so much travel, with EuroLeague, you kind of take a more detailed approach where every every team is on um, the coaches have them um, detailed very good. And um, I think you get a real good feeling of who you're playing, and I think it gives you a better chance to win every night. All right, you went, uh, you went undrafted in 2012 but later signed with the Cleveland Cavaliers. I want to give you a date, and I want you to tell me what this date means to you. November 29th, 2012, what does that mean to you? November 29th, 2012, is that, is that when I got um, called up? Yeah, it's, uh, you, know, you were tearing it up in uh, three games in the D-League and you know, averaged 27 and 14. And uh, you re-signed with the Cavs only to be waived that same day. And I just wanted you to you know, take me through the emotions of that day. Um, man, uh, it was great emotions. It was, um, it was like, um, your, your dream, your lifelong dream being fulfilled. Um, and, uh, you just worked so hard to get to a certain point. And, um, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was a dream come true, really, just that, to know that your hard work has led you up to the place where you dreamed about and people that you've seen on TV and people that you've idolized throughout the years. It, it was definitely a dream come true, I would say. Right, and I'm sure that day, you know, it was a roller coaster of emotions. Also, who uh, who I'm talks sorry, the most the most trash in the you know whether it be Euro League, NBA, anywhere? Who has, who has really you know got in you a little bit? 
um, I wouldn't say anybody's talked uh, a lot of trash to me. Uh, um, fortunately for me, I haven't gone up, or maybe people don't feel like um, they can get to me because I'm, you know, I'm uh, kind of cool on the court. I, I don't feel like I can really get rattled. So I haven't say, um, I wouldn't say that anybody has talked so much trash to me, but in person, as I've seen on the court, I would say uh, definitely Kevin Garnett, which is my, my favorite player. He, um, he talked a lot of trash, whether it was just talking to his teammates, whether it was talking to the opponent. I would just say he was a guy that was constantly talking, whether it was good or bad. Right. I can see, you know, Kevin, he, he likes to mix it up a little bit. I can see him just talking to himself all the time. You know, he, he is a talker. Um, do you have, uh, you know, I'm a Cavs fan. I've been a lifelong Cavs fan. And, uh, of course, a WU fan being from right here. So it's, it's an honor to get to talk to you. Um, is there any kind of juicy details, you know, you can give us from – for a Cavs lifer from inside the locker room for your time spent there? Anything that went on, you know, that uh, is kind of interesting? Um, Cavs life inside the locker room. Well, for me, um, it was kind of crazy. You know, I was a rookie, so um, being there with um, Tyler Zeller and Deion Waiters, who were also rookies, um, I think life for me was kind of different because, you know, I, like I was, those other two guys were drafted. I came in undrafted, you know, kind of had to prove myself a little bit more. So I, I felt like just coming in, I had to work as hard as possible. Um, every practice, every game, every chance I got a minute to get in, I had to uh, was a minute to prove myself. So coming from my perspective, it was just, like I said, a, a lifelong dream for me, and I didn't want to uh, waste that, that opportunity. So I did everything I could to, you know, try and, try and maintain focus and um, be on my A game every day. Right, and as far as uh, – I'm sure you're still you're pretty close with the Cavs. I mean, I'm sure you know some things going on. And as far as the turmoil that they have going on right now and with the recent lineup change and some things they got going on behind the scenes, uh, you know, what's your take on that? What do you think the, the problem is there? And do you think it is time to panic, or do you think it's not? Um, honestly, it's a, <clears throat> to me, it's a new team. You know, anytime you have a new team with new pieces, no matter how good the players are, you're going to struggle for a little bit because people are not used to playing um, with each other. So I think it's just a struggle right now. I definitely don't think it will continue. I think after All-Star break is um, when those guys will get it together more and, and, um, and gel better. But I think as of right now, they just hit a little tough spot, you know, especially with Isaiah Thomas coming back and, you know, the kind of player he is. It, it's just trying, They're just trying to find a way to get everybody on the same page, and I don't think they've done it yet. Okay. But I don't think it's time to worry. Okay, yeah. yeah, well, you know, we had that discussion at the beginning of the year. you got a lot of new pieces, and, it, you know, it takes chemistry. you got to develop that chemistry. And then Isaiah Thomas coming back late in the season, you knew it was going to take a while, but, you know, a lot of people think, with everything going on right now, and I'm sure there's going to be some moves made, and I can see them being sellers rather than buyers, you know, after the All Star break. But just, just wanted to see if there was anything there that you know we need to panic about right now. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think there's any time to panic. Like, like you said, uh, people expect um, teams to come together and just be um, instant, um, instantly great right off the bat. And most of the times that doesn't happen. Most of the times it takes some time for people to get together. You got different personalities, different styles of play so it takes some time but the the best guy at doing um getting everybody together and, and making everybody play at the maximum is LeBron James so I, I think they have a good chance like I said after the all-star break to become a better team right absolutely okay be, being a kid uh, is there an adjustment period you know going back to WU is there an adjustment period to adapt to uh you know Huggins hard-nosed play style and coaching style and things like that Oh, yeah, definitely, for sure, especially if you haven't been coached like that or hasn't been, you know, talked to the way he can, you know, he can get up under some guys sometimes and the way he talks to you, he says a lot, a whole lot of um, things that, um, you know, if you're not mentally strong, that, you know, you can you can fold under that kind of pressure. Um, but I think for me, what helped me was my, my coach in high school wasn't too far off from Coach Huggins. He kind of ran, he kind of ran the same kind of program, made everybody, um, responsible for themselves and you know kind of really got us ready for the college life what we were going to face down the road so I think that was my biggest advantage because coming from a, a background in high school where I did have a coach who you know would get up who would get into guys and you know who would um try to light a fire up under you so when going to coach Huggins of course that's an extra level but I was already kind of used to um, criticism and constructive criticism so I didn't take it as hard as other players did 
Right. Okay. I've interviewed a lot of a lot of WU players. I've interviewed Daryl Talley, Pat White, Steve Slate, and Juwan State, and then I've asked everybody the same question: What is your favorite part about being a Mountaineer? It's just the atmosphere, um, game day, just um, seeing seeing the Coliseum with the gold and blue. Man, it's it's, it's nothing like it. People, um, the fans just support um, like like no other. Um, like no other fans that I've been around, and uh, we, you know, we are the pro teams in West Virginia. So everybody comes out to see us. So you definitely just want to do your best for everybody, and um, just the way that the support from the the fans and the people of West Virginia is, is great. All right, I seen. Uh, matter of fact, I seen just a couple of days ago on my on my time hop where you the day you resign or you signed with the Cavaliers and they waived Luke Heron Goody, and I thought it was kind of funny that on my time hop I, I was. I knew you could compete. I know you would be okay in the NBA, but I want to see you how you could hold up being so thin. So I thought that was pretty funny. Like we, you know, we've been talking the past couple of weeks, and and that showed up. But like I said, it's an honor for me to talk to you, being you know a WU fan all my life, and being a Cleveland Cavs lifer. And I wish you the best of luck in everything you do. I know you're trying to take it to the next level still. So I really appreciate you calling in, man. Yeah, no problem, man. No problem. Um, I, I appreciate you um, having me, and. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I like talking when, whenever somebody, you know, everybody wants to know questions about my experiences there, and I, I just like telling them because I had such a great experience at WVU, so I don't mind sharing it. What can we expect from you going forward? Um, honestly, I don't know. Uh, well, I'm, I'm always working, always working to, you know, get better at my game and in life. And, um, you know, like like you said, I, wanna, I still want to play at the next level. I still feel like... I am, you know, I'm ready and I, I can play at that next level. It's just all about getting the, the right opportunity, and I think that opportunity will come. I just got to keep working and take advantage of it. All right. Like I said, I appreciate it so much, Kevin, taking time out of your day, your day to call in. Uh, we'll talk soon. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right. That'll wrap up Sports Nurse Podcast, Episode 5. Like I said, good to be back. I want to thank, say thank you to my my guest, Kevin Jones, will be back next week with Episode 6. Should have a co-host on that one. We'll have to see how it plays out. Uh, but like I said, I'll, I'll announce in the coming days of who my guest is going to be. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube, follow on Twitter, like on Facebook. The podcast is also archived on the site, and you can find us on Stitcher and uh, iTunes. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week. Thank you.